Y'all, before we begin the show today, I want to make sure you are aware that supporting our sponsors supports the program. I know we do a fundraising push for the resurgent.com and the like, but supporting our sponsors really supports us because it lets the sponsors know that you guys are paying attention. And podcast listeners tend to be among some of the savviest shoppers out there and tend to be among some of the most loyal. So supporting our sponsors supports us. And I got to tell you, this week's sponsor is a great one to support. I've been using their product for a while and love it uh, before even they started becoming a podcast sponsor, and that's Quip. Uh, great, great, great electronic toothbrush and really, really a great one to travel with. And I've tried a lot of them, and this one is the most convenient to travel with. More about it in the show, but please support our sponsors. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. My goodness gracious, the governor's press conference. Welcome, it's Eric Erickson here. 26 after the hour, late start because of the governor's press conference today. Oh, boy. Um, So he he called out Delta for starting this, but um, he gave Casey Cagle the business too. And let's not uh, dance around this. Uh, This was largely directed at Casey Cagle, who I personally think won the gubernatorial primary with this. It doesn't matter that the governor called out Casey Cagle, and it doesn't matter that the governor and and others are now saying this may hurt Amazon from coming uh, to Georgia. What matters is that Casey Cagle is getting credit for the fight, and and there is a deep humorous irony, and I know it has certain campaigns really, really upset that Casey Cagle was, was perfectly happy to and supportive of the sales tax exemption on jet fuel for Delta. They were totally happy. With the sales tax exemption, Uh, his campaign and him with this, uh, they thought it was good for business. They thought it was good for Georgia. And then the NRA thing, he found a winning issue and may have just won the campaign. Folks, this is life. And the governor can come out and say this now. You know, he may get attacked by other candidates if, if Atlanta doesn't get picked by Amazon. You may very well see a situation where the other campaigns come out and attack him. This could be a general election issue. I don't think the Amazon thing plays the way some people think it will. I don't think Amazon coming to Georgia is the huge, huge issue uh, that some people think it is a popular issue. I I think there are a lot of people who really don't like the idea of Amazon coming to Georgia, and Cagle could potentially get credit for scuttling that. And I honestly don't think that uh, Amazon will base its decision on whether or not Casey Cagle did something to Delta. I think there are other factors here. Um, Nonetheless, uh, the governor is going to support this tax legislation. If you missed the press conference, the governor said he will sign the tax law uh, that will lower the tax rate in Georgia for the first time ever uh, without giving Delta the uh, jet fuel exemption. But he says he still wants to give them that and is still going to work on it. Here's the reality. Delta is going to get it. And if Casey Cagle is governor next year, he'll be the one to give it to him. It's just not going to happen in this legislative session. Now, other news. Dick Sporting Goods when we come back. I think you in your meeting with governors earlier this week individually and and as a group we spoke about um, about states taking steps but the focus is to literally give families and give local law enforcement additional tools this is my if an individual is reported to be a, a potential danger to themselves or others and allow due process so that no one's rights are trampled but, but the ability to go to court obtain an order and then collect not only the firearms but all, any any weapons in the position or of that might take the firearms first and then go to court because that's another system because a lot of times by the time you go to court it takes so long to go to court to get the due process procedures uh, i like taking the guns early like in this crazy man's case that just took place in florida he had a lot of fires they saw everything to go to court would have taken a long time so you could do exactly what you're saying but take the guns first Go through due process second. It's just so dumb and unconstitutional. Y'all, you can't 
do that. It's a constitutional right. You can't take someone's property without due process of law. Can you imagine the reaction of Trump supporters if Barack Obama had said this? This is the president of the United States saying he wants police to be able to take your guns without a due process hearing to do so. And by the way, there was ample opportunity in Florida for that to happen. And the uh, sheriff's department and the FBI failed every time to make it happen. Y'all, seriously, can you imagine if Barack Obama had done this, what Trump supporters would be saying? The president also said he wants to raise the purchase age for rifles to 21 from 18, and that uh, the only reason Republicans aren't doing it is because they're scared of the NRA, as opposed to it's a constitutional right. Which leads me to Dick Sporting Goods uh, saying they're getting rid of it. Honestly, I've never met a person who bought a gun from Dick's, and apparently the shooter bought a shotgun there, didn't take it. Um, a, a, but he bought one. I want to read you what a friend of mine sent me. Uh, he says, Dix has little to lose from this. They've got 700 Dix stores that already don't carry ARs, so they're only hurting sales at 35 Field and Stream branded stores. Gun margins are terrible due to all the discounting, so they've shelved a low-profit business that might deliver 10% margins compared to 30-60% on footwear, apparel, etc. And Field and Stream is still selling the Mini 14 and Mini 30 on their site. The Mini 30 is a 20-round 7.62, but it doesn't look assaulty. Um, proof that this is all about cosmetic concerns. Yes! Um, Dix is essentially virtue signaling, like Delta is virtue signaling. Um, I, I wouldn't buy a gun at Dick's to save my life. Honestly, you'd get ripped off anyway. Um, There's a, a ton of stuff unless you catch him at the right sale. All this virtue signaling. Now you got the president of the United States coming out saying uh, to heck with the Constitution. Uh, <laughs> and you can see Mike Pence in this conversation like, ah, no! As he's nodding his head, yes, he's got this look like a deer in headlights. Oh, poor Pence. Oh, my goodness gracious. You know, y'all, this is what happens when you support someone who really doesn't have any intellectual underpinnings. Uh, and if, by the way, the Republicans probably aren't going to cave on this. The president, though, did say he wants to add to the um, background check compliance legislation that uh, John Cornyn is uh, pushing through the Senate to raise the firearm purchase age for long barrel guns to 21. I don't think that's going to happen. And then, of course, you have the Hope Hicks news. I want to deal with Jeff Sessions in the second hour, and it relates to Hope Hicks as well. Uh, but Hope Hicks turning in her resignation a short time ago, right before we went on air, actually, before the governor spoke, the news started breaking. Uh, the White House says Sarah Sanders came out very, very forcefully and said this has been in the works for months. It has nothing to do with her testimony yesterday. Um, that reporters are trying to make this into scandal, trying to tie it to that, uh, but it had already been planned out and they weren't going to try to walk it back or just the schedule based on her testimony yesterday. There's no there there. Um, busy day at the White House and we haven't even gotten to Jeff Sessions. And there's a larger issue here. The pile on of Jeff Sessions begins. Uh, we'll talk about that in the next hour. Uh, a couple more thoughts on the governor, though, when we come back. I want to take a quick time out to thank this week's sponsor, Blue Apron, is treating my listeners to $30 off your first order if you visit blueapron.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. Now, I know there are a lot of you out there who you see all of these, particularly if you're on Instagram like I am and you love to cook, you will see ads for these places that will send you a box of groceries and recipes, and I've tried a bunch of them, and I really like Blue Apron, and I think it's to Blue Apron's credit, in fact, that you got the federal government saying they want to model a food program on what Blue Apron does. They are the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, and they achieve it by supporting a sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, building a community of home chefs, and they offer three plans for you, a two-person meal plan that serve two people choosing eight new recipes per week with the choice to deliver either two or three recipes a week a family meal plan this is what i do meals that serve four people you choose four new recipes per week with the choice to either two three or four recipes any week and they also have a wine plan six bottles of wine from renowned winemakers delivered monthly they offer 12 new recipes each week 
and customers get to pick two, three, or four recipes. Now, I will tell you, I have repeated some of the recipes I've gotten from Blue Apron. Uh, they have a great Mexican casserole dish that my family has come to love. And of all things, a mustard green recipe that you really got to try. Uh, I just, you know, I've never really eaten mustard greens before. And I was like, you know, I'll give it a try. It was fantastic. And then the beef medallions in pan sauce. So we've tried this one before. I, I got it. Once we get used to some of the recipes, we really like them and do them over. But they've got a wide selection of recipes to fit every palate, even the super picky eaters. And I am a picky eater, believe it or not, as much as I cook. I really have enjoyed Blue Apron, and I thank them for sponsoring. Blue Apron is treating my listeners to $30 off your first order if you visit blueapron.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. So check out this week's menu. Get $30 off at blueapron.com slash Eric. It is a better way to cook at Blue Apron. Thank you for sponsoring. Can I just say, before we get into sessions and, and hope picks and, and the like uh, more in depth, uh, we'll do that next hour. Can I just say one more thing that bugs me about the governor's press conference is essentially he's saying that uh, other companies could be dissuaded from doing business in Georgia based on the crony capitalist system we have. Um, that it depends on what the legislature does and the perks given by government to attract businesses to Georgia. Why can't we just have a level competitive playing field in Georgia? Why can't we just uh, d deregulate and uh, lower taxes and make our environment here uh, the environment that businesses want to do? I mean, the governor talks about Georgia being the number one place in the nation to do business, but it's only really that because the government shakes down the taxpayers to give Fortune 500 companies what they want. Uh, I mean, Georgia is number one to do business in the same way the Bunny Ranch in Las Vegas is the number one tourist trap because of the of the prostitutes. Um, that That's exactly what's happening here. We're, we're not, as a state, competitive unless we carve out sweetheart deals. And the governor all but admitted that in his press conference. And I think that's long-term a bad way for Georgia to do business. We need to deregulate. We need to lower taxes. We need to make the state a place favorable for all businesses, those that are here and those that are willing to come. And these games that the legislature plays and that the governor himself and others play to attract businesses – um, that, that blew up in Delta's face today, but those are the games that you can play and you can hold businesses hostage to the whims of politicians when you've got a crony capitalist playing field, when you've got a situation where you're relying on carve outs for businesses to attract them to come to your state. I just think that's the wrong way to go about this as a state. And I wish that we could do otherwise. Now, when we come back, we got to get into Jeff Sessions and Hope Hicks and more on Dix and, and the NRA and the like. Uh, the president of the United States going on the warpath about Jeff Sessions today. I want to explain to you at a macro level why this is problematic beyond Jeff Sessions. With Hope Hicks's departure today, um, I just there's going to be a crisis of confidence in the White House and among his supporters already this evening supporters of the president are coming out very forcefully saying they feel like he has betrayed them on the second amendment. Um, people inside the NRA are calling legislators this afternoon on the Republican side to make sure they're not going to cave into the president's concerns. Uh, the NRA is getting ridiculed for its early endorsement of the president. This is all problematic as we head into the midterm elections. The Republicans need to be a united front. The Republicans need to mitigate uh, the Democrats. And right now it looks like Republicans are going to have to rely on Democrats to beat themselves in 2018. Now, the Democrats may do it on the gun issue, though. That's that's fair. <laughs> And welcome back. It is Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB, the nation's most listened to news talk station, nine after the hour, and we've got to deal with other news beyond guns. Uh, and in fact, we need to start with Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions. Uh, the president on Wednesday attacked the attorney general again 
on Twitter. Let me read you the tweet from the president. Why is Attorney General Jeff Sessions asking the Inspector General to investigate potentially massive FISA abuse? Will take forever, has no prosecutorial power, and already late with reports on Comey, etc. Isn't the IG an Obama guy? Why not use Department just Justice Department lawyers? Disgraceful. Now, what is this all about? Well, uh, the Attorney General said that the Justice Department Inspector General Michael Horowitz is looking into surveillance abuses that the House Intelligence Committee have been arguing about. Um, the announcement was discussed on Fox and Friends, where clearly the president saw it. And I'm not sure which one, uh, but one of them said that Horowitz might need to bulk up his staff. And another one uh, was worried because the guy was, is a part of the Justice Department. Now, you need to understand that um, Horowitz was the inspector general appointed by Obama, but the inspectors general when they're appointed by presidents, uh, Congress, particularly the Republican Congresses, have steered them towards being somewhat hostile to the administration. Um, if you recall, the Obama administration tried to get rid of the inspectors general and put in Obama uh, political apparatchiks into the positions, and the Republicans pushed back mightily against them doing this and won the argument. So, yes, Michael Horowitz was put in there in the Obama administration years, uh, but Horowitz actually has proven himself to be a fairly nonpartisan guy, which is his job. He's had the support of Chuck Grassley and others who fought for him when Obama didn't want him. And it was really Horowitz as inspector general who uncovered a lot of the abuse related to Loretta Lynch and her meeting with Bill Clinton. It wasn't the FBI that did that. It was it was Horowitz doing that and uh, he earned a bitter animosity from people inside the Obama administration for doing that. Now, that that's the president this morning. Uh, Jeff Sessions has pushed back on this. Jeff Sessions said that the in inspector general is going to push back on this, and he released a statement uh, subtly criticizing him. Uh, he, first, he said he wasn't going to comment on it, um, but he, well, he made it pretty clear he wasn't happy. I, I'm sorry. I'm my thoughts are somewhat muddled on this point because it, it is, it's astonishing to me that Jeff Sessions is still there. I'm. I would be surprised if on Monday morning we wake up and Jeff Sessions is still there. Um, he released a statement and said, as long as I am the attorney general, I will continue to discharge my duties with integrity and honor. And this department will continue to do its work in a fair and impartial manner, according to the law and the constitution. Uh, he also said that, uh, the justice department initiated the appropriate process that will ensure complaints against the department will be fully and fairly acted upon if necessary. I really just think that, it's going to be surprising if Jeff Sessions stays much longer. He's wanted to resign several times, um, but there's another angle to this that we need to pay attention to. Okay, now let me read you a tweet from Jerry Falwell Jr. He's replying to the president's tweet. I couldn't agree more. Jeff Sessions must be part of the Bush, Romney, McCain, Republican establishment. He probably supported Donald Trump early in campaign to hide who he really is, or he could just be a coward. Y'all, Jeff Sessions rallied to Donald Trump because of the immigration issue and the wall issue. And uh, he tried to, he has worked behind the scenes to stop the president from caving on the DACA issue. Um, if you didn't have Jeff Sessions there, the president would have caved long ago on the DACA issue. Um, but what is striking here is this immediate attack from the president's sink offense about a guy like Jeff Sessions, who was the only member of the United States Senate to ally with Donald Trump early in the campaign. He told Ted Cruz he would consider supporting him and then endorsed Donald Trump. He was the only senator 
to come out in the in the height of the primaries and support Donald Trump, a man who at the time everyone still thought could be beaten. Jeff Sessions made Donald Trump's campaign a crusade of his own. Stephen Miller got embedded into the White House, the trusted aide of Donald Trump, because of his relationship to Jeff Sessions. To see a guy like Jerry Falwell... And other Trump yes-men and apologists come out and attack Jeff Sessions today remind you of how cannibalistic the Trump movement is. There really is no reason for anyone to get on board supporting the president who's not already there because they are all expected to be yes-men. The only thing you get is punishment if you ever deviate from the party line. There must be absolute loyalty. And what we see from this treatment of Jeff Sessions is it is a one-way loyalty. The president doesn't have Jeff Sessions back. Jeff Sessions has to have the president's back. This undermines the ability of the attorney general to navigate Congress, which helps the president's agenda. This undermines the attorney general. If if Jeff Sessions quits, there's going to be a confirmation process and the Democrats are going to be able to extract demands from the White House. Now, consider this afternoon as well, the, the breaking news story I mentioned in the first hour about Hope Hicks planning to resign. She's having enough. It's come out that Hope Hicks uh, has admitted she she has said little white lies on behalf of the president in the past. Uh, she's probably the most loyal, uh, longest-served advisor to the president outside of his kids, and she's ready to go. This doesn't look good for the president. Things are starting to unravel within the White House. And as things unravel in the White House, it causes more and more pressure on the president with a key date coming. That key date is the midterm election. It is going to be very hard for the president and the Republicans to unify and rally against a building Democratic wave. And I know some of you don't think there is one. It's going to be hard for them to rally against what is probably coming when his communications director is out, when he's fighting with Jeff Sessions, when Trump apologists are attacking people who have been uh, undoubtedly loyal to the president, there's no gain here. There is no reward for anyone supporting the president when his chief apologists and others go out and attack them whenever the president attacks them. No matter how good they serve— If they don't do things exactly as the president wants, and you need to know there's really no choice here because this is a Department of Justice matter. Federal law requires it be the inspector general. Jeff Sessions can't hire an outside investigative team to look at this. He's got to use the inspector general. The inspector general looks at internal department issues and the justice of the FBI is under the rubric of the Justice Department. The reason they have a special counsel looking at the president is the president is not under the rubric of the Justice Department. Uh, But ultimately, the vice, uh, the attorney general has got to serve the law, not the president. And this is a real problem when there is no reciprocal loyalty in this White House, when the president just willfully attacks uh, people under him and willfully goes on Twitter and allows others to go on Twitter. And, of course, there's no way that a guy like um, Falwell Jr. would do this without uh, making sure the White House was okay with it. This is just, why would anyone want to serve him? And when he's got people leaving, who's really of the A-team going to want to go in? You're going to have C's and D's going in. Look, I went long last segment. Um, So I, I just, let me reiterate this point and make it more focused. The president demands unquestioned loyalty from those around him. At some point, the president needs to show loyalty to them as well because they're the people who have his back. And if the president's not careful, they will stop having his back. And though he and you may not think so right now, Jeff Sessions has been the most loyal member of this administration. Jeff Sessions has been the guy out there doing what he can 
to help the president within the constraints of his job. And people tend to forget the attorney general is in the most precarious position of the cabinet because of various Supreme Court rulings going back to the Watergate days on how the attorney general must do his job. Is he accountable to the president? Yes. But can the president direct his investigations? No. There are clear parameters. And so when the president is attacking his attorney general for following the law, it suggests he doesn't understand the law and it suggests he doesn't understand the attorney general who's been his most loyal person. It suggests the president's not very appreciative. And if the president can't appreciate a guy like Jeff Sessions, who took it on the chin repeatedly in the campaign, well, then other people are going to realize, you know, why bother? He's not going to have my back either. And that's going to create a crisis of confidence within the administration. And we're going to see people resign like, oh, I don't know, Hope Hicks. All right. I, I want to go back to one of the stories with governor's press conference and everything else, um, not having time to really delve deep. The president wants to essentially let Dianne Feinstein guide him on guns, he said at a press conference earlier today or at a, at a White House meeting. He also said he wants to take guns before due process hearings. And he also said that Republicans are scared of the NRA, which is why they don't want to raise the age from 18 to 21 for purchasing rifles. This does not sound like a man who fully appreciates the Second Amendment and it does not sound like a man who really has the gun lobbies back. And that's important here because while the left is ridiculing people on the right and the NRA this afternoon over what the president said, the truth of the matter is they're some of his most loyal constituents. And when the president turns his back on them and says things like this, it gives them qualms about further supporting him. So let's look now at what we talked about this hour. You've got a, a loyalty issue in the administration. You, you've got essentially a cannibalistic team of, of top supporters and apologists who will go after anyone on the president's team, no matter how loyal if the president gets mad at them. You've got a crisis of confidence building in the White House where Hope Hicks and others are leaving. You know, the, they lost the deputy communications director yesterday. So they've lost the deputy communications director yesterday. They lost the communications director today. Um, this is problematic overall. And now you're you're making the gun lobby mad. You're making conservatives mad. And there will be some conservatives who will excuse the president and some will say, well, he says this. It depends on what he does. Um, don't hear him. See what he does. And I guess that's fair given this president's track record. But he's sending mixed signals. And what he's doing is he's giving ammunition to the left on this issue. And he's not only giving them ammunition, he's giving them ammunition in a midterm election year when the Republicans need to be mitigating the damage. Now this, I, I just, listen, I think the White House needs to come up with a comprehensive strategy on guns and I think it needs to be a strategy conservatives can get behind. I am opposed to raising the age from 18 to 21 for buying a rifle. Um, by the way, you know, on the Dix issue, um, he left the shotgun that he bought at Dix at home. I honestly, now I don't mean to offend any of you, but I don't recall ever meeting anyone in my life who has bought a gun at Dick's. Now, if you have, I, I just, I haven't met you or I don't know about it and you overpaid. Um, I would never buy a gun at Dick's. Uh, I bought a shotgun at Academy because it was on sale, uh, but I didn't actually go to an actual gun store to buy guns as opposed to going to a sporting goods store like Dick or Academy where you tend to pay higher prices for things. I believe I bought, yeah, I did buy a gun at Bass Pro once again, like Academy, it was, it was, there was a sale. Um, and, and I don't want to dissuade you from going and checking out stuff there, but if you don't catch them on a sale, you're more likely than not overpaying. Go to, a, go to a gun store. Plus, if you go to a gun store, you're going to get better support, I think, overall. Um, Shot Spot in Carrollton. Um, you, you got the, all, you know, we, we've all the Governor's Gun Club. Um, I, man, I, listen, I'm going to get myself in trouble by not naming all the gun stores that we've had people call in about all the time. Um, Adventure Outdoors. 
you name it. Uh, there are a ton of Stoddards. There are a ton of gun stores. Go to a gun store that actually specializes in guns if you're going to buy a gun. Don't go to one of the megapolis national chain sporting goods stores. And that's not just to disrespect them. I go shop at those places when I need other sporting goods. But I just I would rather go to a gun store to buy a gun because those people tend to have, one, a better selection, and two, people more interested in actually making sure I'm getting the right thing. Uh, and getting it at a good price. So, you know, okay. So, y'all, there's something weird about the story at a Dalton High School today as well. So, uh, Georgia high school teacher Dalton High School is in custody on suspicion of firing a gun in a classroom where he'd locked himself in alone Wednesday morning. No one was hurt. The gunfire happened as the principal tried to use keys to enter the room. The teacher refused to let students in the classroom. Now, of course, liberals are other saying, see, you can't trust teachers with guns. You can't trust teachers with guns. We don't know all the facts. This is a weird story. And it's just, it's amazing how liberals are seizing on every little detail out there they think they can use to discredit uh, arming teachers in schools. It, it, not really surprising to me that they would do this. But I just, I am I got the suspicion there's got to be a little more something to the story. And, and we here at WSB will try to keep you up to date as the story develops because it sounds like it's a story that we'll keep developing for a little while longer. Folks, I'd like to thank Quip for sponsoring the show this week. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. Now, what is Quip and what sets it apart? I've been using Quip even before they were a podcast sponsor because I kept seeing their ads on Instagram. Uh, and actually, Jonathan Last at the uh, Substandard Podcast had recommended them. And I'm a big fan. And I'm a big fan for two reasons. One, I hate having to travel with chargers. And with most electric toothbrushes, you kind of travel with a charger. You don't with Quip, which is great. It uses a standard battery and it makes it easy to change. It makes it easy to keep up with. And you don't have to worry about losing your charger or packing your charger. The other thing is the brush head size. A lot of electric toothbrushes have a brush head that is so big, it's hard to get in your mouth, let alone to the back of your teeth. And you got to brush the back of your teeth. Quip's brush head size, it is easy to fit in your mouth. It's easy to get into those tough to reach spots in the back of your mouth. I really like it. And the cool thing is it pulses and every 30 seconds, it stops very briefly. Just so you know, you've got a countdown for two minutes, brushing your teeth like Dennis recommend. And so you can time it. You got 30 seconds. You got the little pause, you know, okay, it's now time to work this side of the mouth, pause. And in uh, on the fourth one, it, it buzzes three times. So, you know, it, it you're done. You brush your teeth for two minutes. I have really enjoyed the experience. Having gone through multiple toothbrushes from some of the big brands, Quip is the one I like. It's the one I stick with. And, you know, it, it, mail order, they will send you every three months for just $5, including free shipping worldwide, a new brush head. So you never have to worry about uh, your brush heads uh, getting to the point where they're just not good. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K, right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush that's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash eric it's spelled g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com slash eric e-r-i-c-k you gotta try quip it is a great great thing and if you travel again this is why i love it more than anything else you don't have to worry about rechargers you don't have to worry about chargers none of that your toothbrush is going to go with you and it's going to work y'all i'm still laughing at this delta debacle um, and the governor having to get involved and everything else. Uh, I just, I, I, they brought them on themselves. They should have known better. Let me end this evening by saying this. There's a communications problem at Delta, uh, a leadership problem. And I don't think it's at the top of the company, but somewhere in their crisis communication systems, they had a complete breakdown and they need to figure out how to fix it because they're not doing themselves any favors. And I fly Delta. I, I'm not going, I don't boycott. Um, I just say, you know, they're a company that they fly where I need to go. I've got a ton of frequent flyer miles and I'm not leaving them. Um, I don't care who they do and do not business with by and large, uh, do not do business with. And I think the government shouldn't bully any business or individual about who they do business with. That's why I'm opposed to forcing Christian businessmen to bake cakes for gay weddings. I don't think the government should be forcing people to do business with those they don't wish to do business with. 
At the same time, I, I'm opposed to the crony capitalist system that Delta has propped up in the state for years and has profited from and benefited from uh, through the years uh, with its lobbyists at the legislature. So it, it's really a double-edged sword. You live by crony capitalism, you die by crony capitalism. And that's the situation with Delta here. They do not deserve this tax break. No company does. Uh, jet fuel, like your gas, is something that gets taxed, and you shouldn't carve out an exception. At the same time, it is worth considering that it puts the Atlanta airport in a competitive disadvantage because every other major aviation hub in the country has such a tax exemption. Why? Because it lowers ticket costs for passengers generally, and it also, well, if you believe Delta will, and the legislature would allow them to fly elsewhere. I think this is time for our legislature and governor to figure out they need to demystify and reduce complexities of our tax and business regulatory system in Georgia. But they have no intention of doing that, and Delta doesn't really care because it tends to benefit from crony capitalism. So I'm not losing sleep over this issue, and you shouldn't either. And I am out of time. I will not be here tomorrow. Mark Aram will be in for me. i got to go to California to speak to the American Bar Association, but I will be back on Friday. You guys have a great evening.